Hello again, everybody. Jeremy Sedlowski is back here with you for uh, February 2020 CME. Dustin Siebel. We're going to be covering uh, trauma management, uh, some patient assessment, and some responder safety stuff. Okay, so for our objectives for uh, this month, we're going to work on, uh, you know, trying to understand our trauma patients better and, you know, the mechanisms of injury um, that uh, cause them to be hurt. We're going to work on ensuring appropriate patient care and, then, you know, talking about life-threatening, potentially life-threatening treatments that we were going to, we're going to do. Uh, make sure we understand the capabilities of our trauma centers and our other hospitals, and uh, make sure we understand uh, you know some scene safety concepts and just talk about how scene safety is dynamic and ongoing. All right, remember scene safety is dynamic, ongoing, and it begins upon dispatch. It includes vehicle safety, apparatus placement, staging, and maintaining situational awareness at the scene. Exactly. Once we get on scene, uh, you, we're in compliance with the new PHTLS updates. Um, we're going to talk about some patient assessment stuff uh, and our goals of trauma care. The uh, PHTLS way um, adds an X in front of A, B, C, D, E. We learned about A, B, C, D, E being airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Um, the X in front of that's for treating life-threatening uh, hemorrhage or exsanguination. That's what the E stands for. We want to make sure we treat exsanguination first in trauma, follow all your hemorrhage control steps, and continue through your primary assessment. And uh, lastly, after we treat that, that life-threatening hemorrhage, we want to make sure we continue through our uh, primary assessment. We want to address any life-threatening conditions um, that's the only time that we would stop our primary assessment is to address life-threatening conditions and treat them um, or if our safety becomes an issue. Um, we'll make sure every patient gets a hands -on, thorough hands-on assessment um, so we don't miss any uh, injuries, make sure they get treated and stabilized. And last, we want to make sure the patient gets transported to the closest and best facility to treat their condition as fast as we can do it. Remember, safety is paramount on every call. A clinician who is injured cannot help a patient. Maintain a state of readiness for yourself and your apparatus. Right, and always be aware of any you know, conditions prior to your response. We want to make sure we know the weather patterns. If it's raining, it's pretty unpredictable sometimes in Florida. Um, know your traffic, know of any road closures. You know, you have a, a baseball game down by the stadium. That could really mess up your ride down to Bayfront. Um, and we want to make sure we park our apparatus in the right spot, you know, to ensure safety. You want to block traffic when need be. And we also want to allow accessibility for the transport units uh, in and out. Uh, I know the Sunstar folks will thank me for uh, reminding our fire guys to not park the fire truck directly in front of the driveway. All right, for staging, remember, be aware of the call location prior to determining your staging location. And again, we want to make sure we're not parking in front of the scene um, or anywhere near we can put ourselves in danger. You know, don't park at the end of a, of a cul-de-sac where a bad guy could drive past you. Um, and most importantly, don't be afraid to retreat. Drop your gear and go. Um, let dispatch know if there's a problem, um, but don't be afraid of abandoning your patient or anything like that. If there's, a, if there's a problem or your safety is at risk, you need to get out of there. Um, use that SIMS code H, that orange button, if you need to. Um, try and follow up with dispatch if you can, but if, uh, if you can't, just know that help is coming and a lot of it. Remember, with ballistic gear, not every agency carries it or has access to it. Don't be afraid to wear it. However, if you're going to a shooting or where a shooter left the scene, you should consider your ballistic gear. Uh, make sure you're familiar with it. Remember, it is uh, one size fits all. Make sure that you are sizing it at the beginning of every shift. So, Dustin, <laughs> how often do you guys wear your ballistic gear at the fire station? Uh, well, at least for me, I like to wear it. Uh, I, I started wearing it on medical alarms when there is a key pendant activation and there is a lockbox outside with no answer on callback. Uh, that tells me that someone may have rolled over in their sleep and accidentally hit their button. Uh, I believe the statistics are one in every three, don't quote me on this, but one in every three houses in Florida has a gun. So for me, if I'm breaking into somebody's house, I'd like to have a little bit of extra protection. I know we've had a couple, uh, incidents recently where had the person on the other side of the door had a gun they probably would have shot us because they really thought we were breaking in on them that's pretty scary yeah don't be afraid to wear that gear guys that's what it's there for so for incident response and safety we want to make sure we're maintaining that situational awareness um, regardless of what's going on or how critical the patient is um, we always want to consider things like you know our power lines are always live you know, until Duke Energy says they're not. And again, just never, ever let your guard down and trust your instincts. Okay, for our scene size up, um, you know, this is one of the most important parts of our, our managing our trauma patient. Um, this We get a lot of information from here. How, you know, where is the patient? How long before the transport unit will be there? How many patients are there? Um, do we have enough people there to handle all of them? Um, do we need help? Is there extrication? Um, do we anticipate any other delays accessing the patient? Is the patient on the roof? Is the patient trapped under rubble pile? You know, stuff like that. Um, if there's a delay, would air transport be beneficial to the patient? Right. Now, are there any violent or dangerous acts occurring? Just like in the systematic approach, what do you hear? What do you see? What do you smell? What kind of scene is it? 
We've talked about that before. Uh, the patient, are they awake, unconscious, are they altered? If you suspect injury or if there's potential for injury to the spinal column, take appropriate precautions. Okay, so again, back to that primary assessment. Again, it's X, A, B, C, D, E, and uh, X is for exsanguination. We want to make sure we're fixing any of the life-threatening hemorrhages first. And then on your uh, the rest of your primary assessment, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Um, if there's an airway compromise, snoring, respiration, something like that, we want to make sure we're fixing the airway, whether it's a BLS, oral airway, NPA, whether it's a jaw thrust, whatever that needs to be um, to make sure we get the patient's airway open. We want to make sure the patient's adequately ventilating. We want to make sure the patient's moving blood around. If they're not, they don't have an airway, they're not breathing, they don't have any circulation, we want to make sure we're starting CPR. Um, disability in the patients, again, this is an acute finding. This is not your patient that, uh, you know, has cerebral palsy or they're in a wheelchair or, you know, they walk with a walker after a stroke. This is a new disability um, from some type of injury that the patient just occurred. And we want to make sure we expose them. This is a uh, pretty quick, you know, it, when it comes to exposure, we're not necessarily cutting clothes off here, but we want to try and expose what we can um, to make sure we're not missing any life-threatening injuries in that primary assessment. And continuing with your primary assessment, remember uh, the primary survey may be interrupted only to correct life-threatening conditions or for threats to responder safety. Some of those life-threatening conditions are uncontrolled hemorrhage, airway obstruction, respiratory arrest, tension pneumo, and pulselessness. So again, that E for exposed, once we get that done, um, we want to check for additional injuries. This is a rapid hands-on, real quick head to toe. Again, we're just checking for other life-threatening injuries. Um, it's, this is not your detailed assessment. Again, just a rapid assessment for injuries to determine the patient's severity and any other needs you might have um, to get this patient properly cared for. And again, right here, don't forget to evaluate the patient's back. This might be a good time to put a backboard under the patient if that's warranted, um, but we want to make sure we're not missing any uh, life-threatening injuries that could occur to the patient's backside, uh, assuming that you found them supine. All right, so your rapid trauma assessment, again, we want to determine the patient's severity. Is the patient sick? Are they not sick? Are they not quite sick yet? Uh, make sure we know what the patient's trauma alert status is um, as compared to state criteria and our local criteria. Uh, make sure we make that declaration. And, uh, you know, again, wound care in the rapid trauma assessment should not be, uh, should not be occurring here. And, and as a reminder about wound care, um, control of life-threatening hemorrhage, tourniquets, stuff like that, that's not wound care. Wound care is something like, you know, bandaging or splinting or putting on a Sager or something like that. Um, but, again, putting on a tourniquet is not considered wound care. That's, that's fixing a life-threatening condition. All right, so for trauma alert versus trauma transport, be sure to know the trauma alert criteria. And remember, not every patient who needs a trauma center is a trauma alert, but every trauma alert needs what? Trauma center. That is correct. And uh, one quick other thing about trauma alerts, um, trauma alerts that become trauma arrests need to be diverted to the closest hospital, um, except if they have an unmanageable airway. If your patient can't get an airway on, um, you can take them anywhere, um, regardless of their alert status. Take them anywhere, make sure we get an airway um, done for them. Oh, and what do we want to do uh, as early as possible? Uh, we want to make sure we give a report to the receiving facility, um, especially for trauma alerts, um, and try and be as, as rapidly detailed as you can here. Does the patient need blood? Do they need a vent? Do they need other emergent care? Um, once you arrive, that way the trauma center can be prepared for them. All right, transport determination. Where are we going? How are we getting there? And how much help do we need? Or how much help's on the way? Remember, at least two paramedics should be attending to the care of all alert patients. That's your tra trauma alert, stroke alert, your STEMI alert, and your sepsis alert patients. Right, so if the patient uh, does require a trauma center, which one's gonna be the closest one to you? Um, if there's gonna be a delay in patient, uh, in accessing the patient or transporting the patient, you know, perhaps air is a better choice. Uh, Dustin, at uh, five o'clock in the afternoon at Tampa Road 19, how quickly you get into a trauma center? Uh, not very fast, guess what I'm gonna do? Air transport upgrade. Right, so again, with extended extrication, you know, the, uh, using a helicopter needs to save you some time. That's the goal of using a helicopter. Um, but you know, Park Boulevard, three o'clock in the morning, park in 49th Street, um, Pedestrians down the roadway, you got an ambulance there, um, definitely faster to go by ground at that point. Again, the object is to get the patient to the trauma center as quickly as you can. Um, and, uh, you know, make sure we know how sick the patient is, what interventions you anticipate along the way. And like Dustin said, make sure you have enough help to manage that patient in the back of the ambulance. Patient packaging. Remember, use appropriate SMR for the patient. Review your mom protocol, CT11, for spinal precautions. And remember that you do have options. Not every trauma patient requires SMR. Um, but every trauma patient should be evaluated for SMR. And remember, uh, like Dustin said, there are options out there. Patient could be full SMR, might just be a collar, could be a vacuum splint. Um, there's a lot of options available to us through CT11. Just make sure you review that and uh, do the appropriate thing for your patient.
So just as a reminder, um, you know, the last dozen or so slides that we've covered here have talked about, uh, you know, some rapidly occurring patient care. We're talking like 60 to 90 seconds of being on scene. And uh, again, you know, trauma care occurs systematically but it, and usually concurrently. We got a lot of people on scene that know what their jobs are, and a lot of this stuff is getting done pretty quick. We kind of slow it down in here to talk about it and break it down a little bit, um, but it goes a lot faster than that. Um, so again, we don't necessarily have to wait uh, for the assessment to be complete before we determine how sick a patient is. If you walk up, you know it's a trauma patient, you know they're unresponsive, you know they're a trauma alert, get this ball rolling pretty quickly. Um, again, same thing with life-threatening hemorrhage. You walk up, you see life-threatening hemorrhage. We know we need to fix that. We know the patient's a trauma alert. Um, let's get moving in the right direction. Get in and get going. While packaging and preparing for transport, determine who will be riding with the patient. Remember, take all the help you need. Don't come up short in a land of plenty. Take 5, 10, 15, I don't care how many you take, just take enough hands to make sure that you have what you need to take care of your patients. Yeah, I feel like 5, 10, or 15 might be might be kind of a lot. It's like mm -hmm. having a frat party back in the ambulance. Whatever works. Right. Regardless, um, the, whoever's driving um, should not be getting in the back of the truck. Right. Uh, make sure we identify who's going, like Dustin said, and know who those people are. The driver should be helping to get everybody in the back of the ambulance, get them all seat belted, and we need to be getting on the road as quickly as possible, try to minimize whatever delays. And with that being said, like we talked about, take all the help because one paramedic cannot adequately care for a critically injured patient, regardless of how good they are. Now, I know some medics in this county that could probably take care of two or three at a time, but don't be that guy. So when you get in, you get going, you get, you're doing some care in the back of the ambulance. You know, this is where that detailed uh, secondary assessment uh, occurs. This is where we're doing our bandaging, our splinting, and our other non-life-saving skills. Um, like Dustin said earlier, we want to make sure this is where we're notifying the hospital with a short, but we want to be comprehensive report. Um, and just as a reminder, anybody who's not actively performing care for their own safety should be seated uh, with their seatbelts fastened, um, you know, during the ride. Kind of like what they tell you, Bush Gardens on the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so that would probably hinder taking 10 or 15 people. Yeah, I don't think there's enough seatbelts in the back of the ambulance for 10 or 15. Well, it, it says please wear your seatbelt unless absolutely necessary to perform patient care. Right. So if you've got to perform patient care, obviously you're going to take your seatbelt off because you're going to take care of the patient. And you can't really do that from a jump seat. I want to ride shotgun. All right. Care during transport. Remember, we're going to do a reassessment. Uh, zero reassessments provide trends, ABCs, vital signs, interventions, and we want to review any uh, changes in entitled CO2 in the ECG or the 12 lead. Remember, for your red patients, we're getting vital signs how often? Five minutes. And for our yellow patients? Ten minutes. And for our green patients? Fifteen minutes. Perfect. So some pearls of trauma care, uh, just as a reminder, you know, giving too much fluid to a trauma patient uh, can actually be bad for the patient. You can disrupt clot formation and increase bleeding. And you kind of trick the body into believing that, uh, you know, bleeding is stopped in some cases. So we want to make sure we're, you know, managing the fluid appropriately, giving the patient the fluid they need, but not giving them too much. And based on the patient, you know, a, a permissive hypotension might even be uh, in order for the patient. Uh, reminder, our head injured patients should never have a systolic blood pressure less than 90. Um, this gets complicated in a multi-system trauma patient who might be bleeding internally. And we want to try and manage their blood pressure. Um, we don't want to get it too high, but we definitely can't have it too low. Um, we want to maintain, and, and for our, all of our head injury patients, um, we want to make sure that our end tidal CO2 is between 35 and 45. The only time we would drop it below 35 is if the patient is actively herniating, and that means they're dying in front of us. That means they're seizing, they're posturing. Um, again, 35 to 45 for our head injured patients. We do not routinely hyperventilate, hyperventilate our patients. Excuse me. Um, 35 to 45, that's a magic number for everybody. Right. Uh, but remember, for our burn patients, they are going to require a significant volume replacement. Uh, fluid replacement for burn patients, if you're looking at a patient that's over 16 years old, you're looking at 2,000 mLs. Um, for patients 13 to 15, uh, 1,500 mLs. And for anyone under 13 years, we want to make sure we follow the... Hand tabby. Hand tabby. And when it comes to burn, so there's, you know, the, the fluid that they're going to get on scene um, or during transport is, is going to be dramatically increased when they get to the hospital. Um, depending on whether or not they're using Parkland or Consensus or whatever the burn center is using, there's going to be a lot more fluid. This is just us getting them started. Right, and that fluid that we're getting them started with will actually uh, translate over to the hospital's Parkland form. So it's very important to keep track and keep record of what you actually gave to your patient and route to the hospital. Pearls of trauma care. Kind of like my granny Pearl. Your grandmother's name's Pearl? No, not really. I always wanted one named Pearl, but no. Can we just call you Pearl? You can call me whatever you want. All right, Pearl. Go All ahead. Right. So, H-bombs of TBI, what are they? 
Your H bombs are hypoxia, hypotension, and hyperventilation. Again, H bomb is a bad thing um, when it comes to your traumatic uh, brain injury patients. It is a horrible thing. It is bad. Um, so again, we want to uh, make, make sure we're not inducing those H bombs. You know, make sure every patient's getting oxygen, and we're going to support their circulatory system as needed. Um, any patient who needs oxygen should get oxygen. Um, all of our trauma alert patients with the quality measure need to make sure they're getting some sort of supplemental oxygen. Obviously, if they're 98, 99%, we don't need to blast them with high flow O2. Two, four liters might be plenty. Um, but if they're starting to get down to the 95, 94s, we want to make sure they're getting high flow O2. This is where critical thinking comes in. If we anticipate the patient is going to have a bad airway maybe down the road, um, this is where high flow O2 might get started. Um, so we can start washing out some of that nitrogen and replacing it with oxygen. Um, again, maintain that systolic blood pressure greater than, than 90 millimeters of mercury. And uh, like we said earlier, uh, mortality doubles from a single instance of hypotension in your brain injured patients. Hypotension in brain injury is bad. And we want to maintain that ventilatory rate um, to have an end title of 35 to 45. Do not hyperventilate your brain injured patients routinely. The only time we would increase our respiratory rate, again, is for our actively herniating, actively dying patients. When you see things like seizures and posturing, do not drop that end title CO2 below 35 in your brain injured patients. All right, so for traumatic arrest, we should approach every patient with the intent to work them and save their life. Both criteria must be met to withhold resuscitation. Refer to CS14 for what that criteria is. Exactly right. Um, but make sure that, you know, if you're going to walk up to a patient and you're going to start care on them, we need to make sure we initiate that care through transport unless, of course, some mitigating circumstance occurs. We, we want to make sure that we're, we're starting care and we're not going to be pronouncing patients dead on the scene um, once we've initiated care, again, unless there's something mitigating. And we don't get to determine what unsurvivable trauma is just because a patient goes into cardiac arrest. Um, you know, short of the stuff that's identified in the mom, you know, the patient's head is detached or they're cut in half or something like that. Um, we don't determine what unsurvivable trauma is. And again, like Dustin said, review that CS14 um, protocol that, you know, deceased obvious death and withholding uh, resuscitation. Um, and make sure that we understand that definitive care for trauma arrest occurs at the hospital, not on the scene. There's very few things that we can do for trauma arrest patients, and it just basically is ABC. We can kind of protect their airway. We can breathe for them. Um, we can do CPR, and we can do a, a needle decompression in our attention pneumos. That's all we can do. We can't give blood. We can't do chest tubes. We can't do any of the other life-saving stuff. So, Oxygen administration per Dr. Jameson. Remember, never withhold oxygen from somebody who needs it. Also use a combination of physical exam and carefully interpret the SpO2 to decide if the patient should receive oxygen. Any patient who is objectively hypoxic with an SpO2 of less than 94% should receive oxygen. This is a first pass measure. Also patients that are in shock or impending shock, such as a trauma alert, should receive supplemental oxygen. This is a first pass measure also. Hi everybody, it's Dr. Jamison. Just wanted to uh, thank the group of CME instructors who put together this month's um, program. And I also wanted to talk very quickly about just a few topics. The first is uh, tension pneumothorax and needle thoracostomy. I want to just uh, quickly remind everybody that uh, needle decompression or needle thoracostomy is indicated for tension pneumothorax uh, and not simple pneumothorax. Performing a needle thoracostomy on a simple pneumothorax can actually do more damage. Um, and we've had a couple of instances where uh, we've actually uh, placed needles when they weren't necessarily needed and ended up with some uh, internal injuries. So I think we've talked about this before, but again, just to reinforce, if you look at CP7, which is the clinical procedure seven needle thoracostomy, the indications are suspected pneumothorax with severe respiratory distress, hypotension, or cardiovascular collapse, which essentially means tension pneumothorax. So even if you suspect a pneumothorax, if they're hemodynamically stable and there's no indication of those things, which is worsening severe respiratory distress, cardiovascular instability, then a needle thoracostomy would not necessarily be indicated at that point. And in fact, you know, tension pneumothorax doesn't uh, progress very quickly. It's, it happens over a period of minutes. Um, and so a lot of people uh, say that they watch their pneumothoraxes and if they become unstable, that's the point where they start considering doing something. I'll tell you in the hospital for a small pneumothorax, sometimes we do nothing at all. We just observe it. 
Uh, other times we'll uh, put a very small what's called pigtail catheter in there to get rid of it. Uh, but in the setting of a, of a trauma resuscitation, the chest should be needled uh, in, in the scenario of a tension pneumothorax as evidenced by hemodynamic compromise or severe respiratory distress and not in a simple pneumothorax. Now the corollary to that is in traumatic cardiac arrest, um, you know, if there's significant trauma to the chest or abdomen, we empirically consider whether there could be a tension pneumothorax as one of the causes that's reversible for a traumatic cardiac arrest. And so then we'll consider doing the, the needle decompression there empirically. But it, if, in a patient who's not in cardiac arrest, it, it's important to make sure that we're really getting to the point where we're convinced that this is a tension pneumothorax before we go ahead and do the procedure. I linked here to a podcast. Uh, it's called MCRIT. And if you really want to nerd out on this and get into the nitty gritty of the hemodynamic uh, function behind what, when you develop a tension pneumothorax, uh, I think it's like 20 or 25 minutes long. And it's a really fantastic discussion if you really want to get into the details of this. Um, really informative. It's got some pretty smart people on there, uh, way smarter than me, who can explain this in a way uh, that you'll really truly understand the physiology. So if you have a minute and you're interested, uh, highly recommend listening to uh, that episode of the MCRIT podcast. And again, the link's right here on the slide. The next thing I want to talk about was the H-bombs. I know they covered it above, um, but I really do want to emphasize these. These are incredibly important. You know, a single systolic blood pressure less than 90 in your, you know, traumatic brain injury patient doubles mortality. A single SAT less than 90 in the pre-hospital arena in your traumatic brain injured patient doubles mortality. And hyperventilating them to a CO2 less than 35 uh, apparently per the data is anywhere between two and six times the mortality. Um, so the, that's why they call them the H-bombs. And if you want to actually get into the details of this and read more about it, uh, find out more about it, um, this all comes from the EPIC uh, trauma registry out of the University of Arizona. Um, Dr. Spade out there has been doing amazing work for years with their EMS systems and understanding traumatic brain injury. Um, there's a link over here to an interview that gets into some of it, and then if you just uh, Google some of the names or, or things you hear in that interview, you'll be able to find all the papers that describe um, how they came to the conclusions and, and figured out that these H-bombs are so incredibly important. So in practice, that means that we really have to make sure we don't allow hypoxia or hypotension in these patients. It means that we actually have a higher blood pressure goal for this patient than we would for a general trauma patient. So that's an important thing to remember. And if you look at the protocol, there's actually uh, a range of blood pressures depending on what kind of trauma patient it is. So those fluid resuscitation goals change depending on what kind of trauma patient it is. Uh, and the, the one that's probably even more worth talking about is the CO2. What happens when you hyperventilate the patient uh, is that the cerebral arteries constrict and you decrease cerebral blood flow, you decrease cerebral perfusion. Now, obviously, if you have an injured brain and you decrease the blood flow to the brain, you're going to make things a lot worse. So that's why uh, the hyperventilation is bad. Now, this is a tough one, though, because for years we were taught bad head injury patients get hyperventilated. Plus, you got the adrenaline going, so you tend to want to squeeze the bag a little faster. And so the ask is that, would you please pay really close attention to the CO2 in these patients and keep that CO2 in the normal range, that's 35 to 45, and don't drop them below 35. Now, there is the caveat about hyperventilating them, but that should only occur if they're actively herniating in front of you, like they just started posturing and blew a pupil, that kind of actively herniating, not just they have a bad head injury. And when we do that, we're only doing that down to 30 to 35. We should never be taking these patients below a CO2 of 30. The uh, impact of their mortality is extreme. So again, that's a, that's a tough one to do in the heat of the moment, but it's really important to pay attention to that CO2 as well as the SAT and the blood pressure in your traumatic brain injury patient. And again, if you wanna read more about that, this all comes from the Epic Trauma Registry out in Arizona with Dr. Spate, and I put a link right here on the slide to a, uh, a good interview. The next thing I wanted to talk about was ejection. I still get every now and again the question about what constitutes an ejection. So I'm sitting on my uh, motorcycle at a stop sign and somebody comes over and taps my rear wheel and I fall off the bike. Is that an ejection? Uh, probably not. Um, this is one of those ones where we have to ask for a little bit of common sense. An example I sometimes use is a jet ski. 
if I'm riding a jet ski around and I do a loop and I go flying off the side of the jet ski and I'm laughing my butt off because that was really fun and cool or whatever, then that's not really an ejection, right? But if I drove that same jet ski into a seawall at 40 miles an hour and went flying off it, maybe that is an ejection. So this is one of those ones where, you know, we need a little bit of judgment on this. The ejection criteria comes from the CDC uh, triage for trauma criteria. It's, uh, it's one of the ones that we think it, uh, is a reasonable indicator of a mechanism of injury. But again, it just has to be applied with a little bit of common sense. Um, obviously, if there's any question about uh, it, you know, you can do a consult. But in general, that's a common sense kind of a thing. And finally, I just want to reemphasize that we've talked a lot about trauma this month. Um, and we talked, you know, medicine last month, which is a lot more of a process of differentiating what's going on with your patient. But trauma is really algorithmic. Make sure that you don't overthink it, okay? It's easy to get wrapped up in individual little things while you're looking at a real sick patient, but really all you need to do for trauma is follow the pathway. So that's X, A, B, C, D, E, and you just really just, you know, if you find something, you fix it, and then you move to the next letter. And if everything looks good, you go through that, and you really just keep rechecking those things all the way to the hospital. So trauma, don't overthink it. It's pretty straightforward. It's it's pretty much just get through the algorithm, find it, fix it, and move on. And again, we really just want to get these uh, trauma patients, particularly penetrating trauma patients, to the hospital just as quick as we can. So again, I want to thank the CME instructors uh, that uh, designed and built and uh, executed this month's training and um, wanted to just reinforce a couple of those things to you. As always, if there's questions or concerns, please reach out. Uh, if there's clarifications or if you find something in the protocols that you think uh, needs to be updated, changed, or corrected, please let me know and um, be safe out there. Thanks.